University of Tübingen. And as said, uh, thanks for the introduction. I will present some data out of my PhD research. So this is an out my outline for the talk, which is very original, as you can see. Uh, I will first give an introduction, then I will present materials and methods, followed by results and discussion, and finally some conclusions. This is the region that I studied in the course of my PhD, which is the Swedish Jura. As you can see down there, it's located in southwest Germany. It's a hilly region, karstic region, uh, which is crossed by nearly dry valleys, and uh, it's quite rich in cave sites. And the cave sites, the main cave sites, are clustered in two valleys. One is the Ak Valley toward west, and in the east, the Lone Valley. These cave sites are quite famous in, uh, in for paleolithic archaeology because of the rich origination um, materials, let's say. From Holyfest and from Geisenklosterle, from Holyfest, there is the oldest Venus coming from, the, from Holyfest and Geisenklosterle, the oldest uh, uh, musical instruments. And from Hollenstein Stadel in the Lone Valley, this side here, uh, we have the Lion Man, which is until today, at least, the oldest example of uh, figurative art, which, which is a sculpture made out of ivory. And uh, after this uh, rich organization, there is a not very rich, actually, Gravettian. And um, I depict, these are just uh, the uh, schematic representation of the stratigraphy of the main sides of the two valley, the Ak in the, up, in the upper part, the Lone Valley in the lower part. And I depicted in blue the Gravettian. As you can see, we have Gravettian deposits in the Ak Valley, which are less rich than the origination deposits, and not so much Gravettian in the Lone Valley. The only, there is just one side that has Gravettian deposits, while there, are, there is some Gravettian dating a bit scattered to the stratigraphy of the other two sides. After the Gravettian occupation, there is a gap in chronology of nearly 12,000 years, which is followed by the Magdalenian reddish brown, the Magdalenian uh, occupation. So the question is, why do we have not so much Gravettian in the region? Why one valley is more Gravettian than the other? And why there is a gap in chronology between the Gravettian and the Magdalenian? So is this resulting from uh, human behavior, human occupation? People didn't like so much one valley, preferred the other valley. At some point, they got bored of the place, they just moved somewhere else. Or is this actually resulting from taphonomic issues? Uh, here, I, I, I just present two uh, sections two profiles from excavations. This is from uh, Holyfest. You see the profile, it's inside the cave. And uh, again, the colors is, are the same as the previous slide. So this is the gravitan deposit in blue, which appear to be truncated on top and covered with sediment, the reddish brown, which is uh, uh, containing Magdalenian artifacts and dating. Uh, on the right, there is another cave site, which is uh, Hollenstein in the other valley, the Lone Valley. The profile comes from the, the, the entrance, an excavation conducted at the entrance of the cave site. And as you can see, it's uh, quite messed up. Uh, so the dark, uh, dark gray, it's the middle Paleolithic with a very weird contact with sediment. They contain mixed dating from uh, Gravettian ages to late glacial ages. And uh, also in the upper part, we have the Magdalenian in this case, which is truncated probably and covered with the nearly sterile late glacial sediment. So the question is, what are these possible disconformities, what are we looking at? Are they resulting from localized erosional processes, or are they resulting from <laughs> regional scale processes, landscape changes? And uh, for sure, the landscape of the region changed through time, in particular on the last glacial maximum. So how these changes uh, impacted on, on the preservation of the archaeological record, in particular on the preservation of the Gravettian record? So this has been the main question that I have uh, addressed or tried to address uh, with my dissertation. And we published already some stuff in this uh, article, which is available online in Quaternary International. And in this talk, I'm going through some of the uh, results that I already published. And I'm also focused, try at least, to, to, to understand and to talk also with you why is the record of the Gravettian so different in the two valleys. So uh, we apply different methods in the course of uh, this, uh, this PSG research. Um, soil macromorphology, as you can see, to study cave deposits, in particular one cave site, Hollenstein in the Lone Valley. We did some occurring, we did some geoelectric imagery, uh, quite a lot of GPR, and with the hydraulic uh, uh, probing machine, we collected easy logging and also coring. Uh, the sediment that we recovered from the cores were, of course, uh, described, photographed, samples, f samples sorry, for micromorphological analysis. FTIR and dating with radiocarbon method, as you can see to the right. Uh, I focus in particular in three spots uh, for, uh, for my research. 
one in the Apale, uh, in front of the cave site of Olifels. Olifels is this uh, darker part that sticks out. It's a big outcrop of limestone, and through it you can uh, access to the cave. And uh, so in this case, we did most of the work uh, just in front of the cave entrance. Uh, in the Lone Valley, we studied two, uh, the, the two sites in front of two cave complexes, which are quite close to each other. As you can see, just about two kilometers walking from one to the other. This is Bockstein, and uh, we covered with our, uh, with our analysis the hillside downslope from the cave complex. And here we have Hollenstein, in which, as I said before, uh, I studied the uh, cave uh, deposit with my morphology. But we did a lot of work actually on the opposite uh, hillside, uh, where with the preliminary work we identified a kind of interesting feature, probably you can still kind of see it in this figure, uh, which turned out to be a sort of river terrace. <coughs> So this is just a schematic representation of the two valleys with the cave sites. Um, with the easy logging and uh, the coring, so to the, to the left you see the Ak Valley, to the right the Lone Valley. Uh, with the coring and the easy logging, we could uh, reach a maximum depth of uh, 10 meters in the case of the coring, 12 of the easy logging, which was more than enough to encounter the bedrock in the Lone Valley, which is quite <coughs> shallow. The bedrock in the Lone Valley is between a meter and a half uh, up to seven meters of depth. But we were absolutely not able to reach the uh, bedrock in the aqua lake, which is much deeper. It's about 40 meters of depth. So we were able to study only the upper portion. Nevertheless, the deeper portion was uh, previously investigated with coring and also uh, geophysical measurements collected in the past decades. So we have an understanding of what's going on below the sequence we investigated. In the next five slides, I'm just uh, summing up which are the main uh, uh, deposits that are present in the two valleys. Uh, and also the main disconformity that we identified, stressing which are the similarities between the two valleys. And the first common aspect is that both the sequences of Ah and Lone Valley start with the river valley incision. This river valley incision is uh, later covered with sediment uh, that contain uh, rewarded, redeposited soil material. And this we see it in particular with the result from our micromorphological analysis. Here I display uh, photomicrographs from uh, the three uh, sites that we investigated. And uh, as you can see, we found, in particular from Box and Honestan, we have nice examples of uh, laminated limpid uh, clay coatings. We suggest that they form during, long, uh, uh, during a phase of uh, relatively long landscape stability. Only in the case of Honestan, these clay coatings are associated with other interesting potential <coughs> cryogenic microfabrics. Now it's a bit tricky because uh, uh, we noticed uh, some aggregates which are very similar, nearly identical, I would say, as you can see, in composition with the ground mass. But they are identified, they are, let's say, defined by this uh, granostriated beef fabric. There was another one here, and they are very rounded, and possibly they give some hints uh, on uh, the processes that led to the destruction and redeposition of these clay coatings, maybe associated with the reflection. It must be said that in most cases, we didn't find anything of that associated with the fragmented clay coatings. So possibly other colluvation. Uh, processes were responsible for their erosion and redeposition. <coughs> On top of this eroded material, we find something very different. Uh, we find sediment that contains fragments of speleothene, as you can see here, uh, grains of phosphatic material, which you can see from this photomicrograph collected in fluorescent lights. This phosphatic material, it's uh, apatite, we know that from FDIR measurements, and uh, contains also silicide grains of quartz, and also micas, it's not, uh, the mica is not in this photomicrograph. And we interpret it as a phosphatized loess. And this uh, interpretation is also supported by the uh, micromorphological analysis I did of the cave sediments from Hollenstein. And also a lot of uh, micromorphological analysis which was conducted in other cave sites of the region, like Chris, uh, Chris Miller, my advisor, he studied the Holdefels and Geisen Klosterle. Also Paul Goldberg studied the Holdefels. And uh, the conclusion of all our work is actually that large part of the Paleolithic cave deposits is composed of phosphatized loess, which looks like pretty much like this. So what we are looking at is cave sediment, which has been eroded from the caves and deposited in the landscape. To associate it with these phosphatized grains, we also find fragments of bones, which are from sand-sized, as you can see here, up to medium gravel-sized. Particularly one fragment of medium gravel-sized uh, comes from Holyfells and has been dated around uh, 28,000, uncalibrated before present, while uh, the cave sediment that we recovered in front of Bockstein is associated with fresh shell fragments in which the aragonite 
is still preserved. And uh, these shell fragments have been dated to 26,000 before present. So the interesting thing is that these two dates fall in the Gravettian time period as published for the Sweden Jura. So which means that what you're looking at, most likely, is sediment that has been eroded from cave, Gravettian aged cave deposits. Uh, this uh, cave erosion, so to say, has been covered later with the deposition of reworked loess. Now, reworked loess is the main uh, component of the uh, fine fraction, let's say, of the sediment of the valley. But these deposits are uh, nearly, complete, uh, nearly exclusively composed by this. So there are no fragments of uh, limestone gravel, there is no fragment of reworked bed of feature. At Bockstein, it's still associated with the deposition of uh, uh, phosphatized material. But otherwise, it's uh, free of any other components, essentially. And it's uh, laminated with some grading. So it has been deposited by low energy water deposition. deposition. And so it's very interesting because it's indicative of a different environmental setting, which probably we're getting in a colder environment uh, and also drier. <coughs> in particular, it's interesting because, of course, the deposition start after the, depo the deposition of loess. Uh, follows the deposition of the case sediment, so it's after 28, 26,000 and calibrated before present. And from the dating of, uh, of uh, the sequence exposed at the, at the entrance of Holstein, we know that the deposition of this sediment type lasted until 14,600 uh, and calibrated before present. The last sediment type that we find very common and very spread in the region, in the landscape and at the cave entrances, is composed by immature limestone gravel, which is embedded in uh, non-decalcified loess. And uh, it's kind of interesting, the geometry of this deposit, because, for instance, this is a, a rudder gram, uh, a GPR measurement, which we collected at, uh, just in front of the cave uh, of Holyfels, from the entrance of the cave toward the valley. And uh, I just drew this uh, dotted line, and below the dotted line, now it's uh, with GPR, you have to cross your eyes a bit to understand what's going on. But uh, uh, let's say between two and three meters, there are some reflectors that gently dips from the cave entrance toward the valley, while, I think that this is quite clear, in the upper part, you have reflectors that are dipping in the opposite direction. So you see this stuff here? These are beds of this immature gravel that is bedding from outside toward the cave entrance. Similarly, we don't have geophysical data from the entrance of uh, Hollenstein, so this part here, this is the cave site. This is the same profile I showed you before, in which we have uh, Magdalenian deposits, partly eroded, and covered with uh, sediment, which is nearly sterile. We have micromorphological data from there, and from the micromorphological results, we can ensure that it's the same type of sediment. It's uh, a lot of fine, immature limestone gravel embedded in a fresh loose. So again, we have a sort of shift with the, these two examples shift in sediment source with uh, after possible some mild erosion occurring a lot of sediment from the outer landscape that comes into the cave filling the caves so what's what's going on here we have basically five phases so to say before 32000 before present there was a phase of landscape stability with the formation of soil in which we have the formation of uh, uh, laminated clay coatings still before 32000 before present after the formation of the soil we have a different setting uh, with probably uh, the formation of, or the aggradation of permafrost or frozen ground, which is retaining water at the surface. We don't have to forget that this is a karstic region. So today the valleys are nearly dry. The water is drained uh, down in the bedrock. Uh, so at some point probably there was, uh, we're getting in a colder uh, climatic phase which, with still some vegetation which stabilized the landscape. The water gets drained into channels which are down cutting the valleys Next, the climate gets colder, the vegetation is nearly gone, it's just grassland. And due to this drop in base level, the landscape is not stable anymore. So we have mass wasting of the hillside and also cave erosion. After that, the position of loess and the position of immature limestone gravel, which are resulting in a phase of fluid plane aggradation. So, all nice and good, very good, we can go home. No. Because uh, uh, there is a problem. We just say that there are similar processes going on in both valleys. How is possible that we have over 2,000 Gravettian stone tools from Van Valley, and we have maybe, if we are optimistic, around 10 Gravettian stone tools from the other valley? So uh, it's a very different uh, uh, context. On one side, there are, there are some elements that we can stress out, like the fact that generally, as you can see, the cave sites in the Ak Valley are bigger in size, like, uh, are bigger in size than the cave sites of the Lone Valley. So this might have uh, allowed a better preservation of the Gravettian deposits. 
in the Ak Valley, or maybe the cave site in the Ak Valley were more intensively used by humans because they like bigger caves, I don't know, uh, or for other reasons. But I think that there are other elements that uh, are probably responsible for this different uh, preservation of the gravitian record. So at the beginning, I showed you know, there is a disconformity at the bottom of the sequence in the Ak Valley, a disconformity at the bottom of the sequence in the Lone Valley. On top of that, we have gravitian ages. Uh, these gravitian ages are found in the Ak Valley at a depth between 8 meters and 9 meters and 6, below the ground surface. In the Lone Valley, they are found at a depth of 4 meters or even 2 meters below the ground surface, so much more shallow, which suggests uh, somehow that uh, uh, in the Ak Valley after the, uh, the incision, there have been uh, an accumulation of thicker uh, valley fillings in comparison with the Lone Valley. Also, I uh, depicted the year in red. The Lone Valley, for sure, underwent another phase of major incision after this incision. So generally, what I'm trying, I'm trying here to say is that it's possible that in some periods after this first incision event, the Lone River might have had a higher water discharge in comparison with the Ak River. And uh, this is also possible if we consider the how big is the Lone River in comparison with the Ak River and also the catchment of one river in comparison with the other. Additionally, uh, based on modern topography, uh, we can see that the stream gradient of the two rivers is quite different today, with the stream gradient of the Lone Valley, which is almost three times the one of the Ak. And so, trying to refine a bit the model that I proposed before, we come up with this, which is a very hypothetical. I don't have a lot of data to support that. It's more like what I think, which uh, when I was writing it in my dissertation, and I said to some of you yesterday at dinner, it sounds like a good idea. When I'm thinking about it today, I'm not so sure. So I'm very happy if you give me some uh, hints about it. So uh, there is an event of incision, as I said before. And in order to have incision, we need to have some sort of uh, frozen ground and uh, a higher water discharge in comparison with the sediment load from the hillside. After that, there is the drop in base level of the valley and the mass wasting of the hillside. Here, there are two different things going on. The Ak Valley, this, in the Ak Valley, this, sed this uh, uh, mass wasting of the landscape is resulting uh, in a, a phase of a fluid per gradation which occur at a faster rate in comparison with the Lone Valley. Here, possibly, the water discharge in the Lone Valley was higher. Therefore, the river was more uh, capable in removing sediment from the base level. Therefore, the, the drop in base level in the Lone Valley lasted probably longer in comparison with the Ak Valley, promoting a more intensive erosion of the Gravettian cave sediment. It's very hypothetical. Let me know what you think. Main conclusions. So the main conclusions are, uh, the landscape changed a lot. It's not a great conclusion, but these changes uh, impact directly on the preservation of the cave uh, sequences. In particular, they cause the removal, at least partial removal, of gravitian age sediments from the caves of the valley. So important implication for archaeology, of course. Uh, second conclusion, which is more hypothetical, is that more intensive erosional processes related to alluvial processes in the Lone Valley led to a more intensive removal of gravitian sediment from the cave site. This is the story. These are my acknowledgments, and also thank you for you, for your attention.